An old man looks out the window. Bright July sun dances across the waves, and the sound of surf gently breaking on the island's shore fills the bedroom. But it is not a pastoral seascape the man sees. Marshal Philippe Pitain looks out of a window to his past, to the glory he won at Verdun, to his tenure as Minister of War, and then to the fateful election that gave him near absolute power over France to his collaboration with Hitler, to participating in the slaughter of his own people, the despoiling of his own nation, and when the army of free France returned to civil war. As Piton closes his eyes for the final time, so does it close a conflicted life led by a man who believed resolutely in the necessary actions of Vichy France. With that, the leader of an often overlooked Axis power goes to his final rest. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. To say the Second World War was a difficult time for France would be an understatement bordering on absurdity. The war was a time of privation and subjugation, as well as political division. With the fall of France, the nation was divided in two, a German-occupied zone to the north and a Nazi client state to the south. This second state would come to be known as Vichy France, named for the resort town that served as its government seat. Headed by Marshal Philippe Pitain, a celebrated general and politician, this fascist France would begin the war siding against the Allies and bringing the Holocaust to the Jews of France, only to find themselves suddenly occupied by Big Brother Hitler when the tide of war turned. In today's video, we will look at the formation, contributions, and eventual downfall of Vichy France. During its brief existence, the citizens of Vichy France were subjected to a constant barrage of propaganda from state media outlets, while harsh censorship laws ensured that even the most innocuous of comments could result in interrogation and imprisonment by authorities. Luckily for us, the sponsor of today's video is NordVPN, which promises to keep your browsing data safe from the prying eyes of anyone who might be looking to censor you or throttle your access to information. In addition to offering you all of the standard benefits of their service, like location changing and safe browsing, NordVPN is happy to introduce their Dark Web Monitor program, which constantly scans the seedy underbelly of the internet and alerts you if your email or personal identity has been compromised in any way. Take advantage of all three critical security features and receive a unique discount by visiting nordvpn.com slash historyvpn and getting 73% off of the two-year plan with one additional month for free, including Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. As the German army fought their way across France in May of 1940, the government of the Third Republic was in turmoil. Opinion was split on whether to keep up the fight against Germany or sign an armistice and pick up the pieces afterward. Prime Minister Paul Renault was of a hawkish bent, but faced stern opposition from his newly installed deputy, Marshal Philippe Pitain. Pitain was loved by the French people for his successes during the First World War, and had returned to Paris following a stint as ambassador to Francoist Spain. Pitain argued vigorously for an armistice, portraying it as a way to halt the carnage and allow the French people to begin the process of rebuilding. As his ministers debated and the Germans continued to advance, Renault began to realize the hopelessness of his situation. On May 26th, Renault took a meeting with Winston Churchill, where the embattled French Prime Minister told the British representative that while he was against signing a separate peace with Germany, the French military had no hope of triumph over the Third Reich. And though Renault would not negotiate with Hitler, he was surrounded by men who would. The British would encourage Renault to keep up the fight, one way or another, until the bitter end. Mere weeks later, the Germans reached Paris, forcing Renault's government to relocate south to Tours. 
The collapse of France was imminent, but the debate over whether or not to sue for peace continued to rage. The pro-armistice faction began to espouse the view that if they stayed and negotiated, the French could, somehow, control the outcome of the peace talks. By engaging with the Germans and signing an armistice, they could have a say over their destiny. Alternatively, the government could withdraw entirely to London, and Renault could lead a French government in exile alongside the Polish. This view was unpopular due to the aforementioned delusion of control, as well as simple anglophobia. Besides, the argument for fleeing was answered with a simple fact. A French government in France would be more powerful than one in England. As Renault tried to find a way out, tried to settle on a definitive course, he began to find himself squeezed in a vice. Pétain and other high ministers began publicly campaigning for an armistice, the deputy prime minister declaring his intent to remain in France and share the French people's fate and suffering. After so much deliberation and debate, after so much pressure and so much back and forth with Britain, Renault resigned on June 18th. Pétain was asked to form a government, and the new prime minister set about obtaining his armistice. The Third French Republic and Nazi Germany would sign the Armistice of June 22, 1940, on, well, June 22, 1940. In a move of petty humiliation, the Nazis hosted the signing in the same train car that had witnessed the surrender of the German Empire in the First World War. All fighting in France would cease, and the French would make Germany whole for the cost of their upcoming occupation. Pétain's ascension after Renault's resignation gave him the requisite powers to negotiate this unequal treaty with the Nazis, who recognized him as the proper authority to treat with them. A number of French military and civilian ministers, as well as rank-and-file soldiers, fled the country to establish the Free French under former Under Secretary of War Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle's group would find little recognition in the Allied camp, with the Free French denied the status of government in exile that would legitimize them. Internationally, Pétain was the legitimate leader of France. As the armistice came into effect, the Germans began the military dismemberment of their conquered foes. The French army was disbanded, save for 100,000 men who would perform internal security duties. The French Navy was ordered to pull all of its ships that were abroad for mothballing, a demand that the British would not accept. A number of French vessels were stationed in British ports, and the Empire feared that the Germans could use a stockpile of French warships in future battles in the Atlantic. The result was Operation Catapult, an attempt to neutralize the French Navy by any means necessary. French vessels in British ports were seized, while a large squadron in Algeria was set upon by the Royal Navy. The British offered to escort the French to ports in Britain, the United States, or even the French possessions in the Caribbean. French Admiral Francois Derlon ordered his men not to comply, and the British attacked their erstwhile allies. Darlan was incensed and ordered the French Navy to attack the Royal Navy on sight. Meanwhile, in one of history's many parallels, the crisis gave Pétain his opening to acquire absolute power. Pétain severed diplomatic relations with the British over their attack in Algeria, and ordered an ultimately ineffective bombing of Gibraltar in retaliation. Pro-German sympathies had begun to manifest in Pétain's cabinet, with many coming to believe Germany would win the war. France must opportunistically make her place in Hitler's Europe or be relegated to the dustbin of history. The fighting on the seas of Algeria had also bred a sense of alienation in the French cabinet, with the Royal Navy's actions seen as proof that France had been betrayed by the British. Deputy Prime Minister Pierre Laval rammed through a quartet of laws that gave Pétain the power to appoint and dismiss ministers and unilaterally enact legislation, dissolved the French Parliament, and empowered Pétain to appoint his successor, who just so happened to be Laval. The dictatorial laws went into effect on July 10th, and Vichy France was born. 
With their fascist future secured, Patal's government set about building a new ideology of hate and acting on it. Like their German partners, the Vichy government sought to weave a narrative around their loss that would bring their chosen people together. The loss to Germany was blamed on the enemies of the homeland, Jews, communists, expatriates, and others. With their targets identified, the Vichy regime set about enacting their own version of the Nuremberg Laws. First, public servants had to prove their father was French. Then, the government began stripping naturalized Frenchmen of their citizenship, many of whom were Jews. Then, French Jews were excluded from public office and all occupations that influenced people, barring Jews from academia, journalism, and the French film industry. With these laws in place, the Vichy regime promised to return France to true French people. It was these true French that formed the Malice, a fiercely collaborationist paramilitary organization. Headed by Joseph Darnon, a veteran of the First World War, the Malice were radically conservative and Catholic, condemning in their oaths of induction such evils as communism, Freemasonry, and Jewish leprosy. Though banned from operating in Nazi-occupied zones, and originally distrusted by the Germans, the Malice would be embraced by the Nazis after Darnall swore a personal oath of fealty to Adolf Hitler. This feudal arrangement would see Darnall made an officer in the SS and the formerly unarmed Malice outfitted with German weaponry. Collaboration would only grow more murderous as the Holocaust began in earnest. Though nominally independent, Vichy France had a stated policy of concession and collaboration, a policy that only intensified as the war progressed. Beginning in October 1940, foreign Jews still living in France were interred by Vichy and German authorities both, a state of affairs that would continue until summer of 1942, when Hitler ordered the total annihilation of European Jewry. Patal's government didn't so much partner with Germany in enacting this order as totally subordinate themselves. Vichy France became the only unoccupied nation to actively round up and export its Jews for slaughter, almost viewing it as a question of sovereignty. Their issue wasn't handing over Jews to die, it was ensuring French hands delivered them. Pierre Laval encouraged the Nazis to take as many Jews from Vichy France as they could, even pushing them to expand the parameters of their deportation mandates to include children. The Patal government received many reports on the existence of extermination camps, so it is highly unlikely these demands were made from a place of ignorance. This is supported by Laval's rejection of an American offer to accept 1,000 children of deported Jews as refugees. Laval decreed that only verifiable orphans would be given to the Americans, but since the Vichy government could not trace deported Jews to determine whether or not they died, they never allowed the Americans to take a single child. Not everyone was as eager to assist the Nazis in their plans. René Bousquet, chief of police for Vichy France, actively sought to prioritize the deportation of foreign-born Jews over French ones due to his knowledge that he was sending them to their deaths. A kind of gruesome patriotism in the face of the Holocaust, Bousquet would go on to ignore German demands for access to lists of Jews as the Vichy state began to collapse, but more on that later. After the war, Bousquet was tried for collaboration, had his sentence commuted due to his isolated instances of resistance, and was ultimately charged with crimes against humanity by a new tribunal in 1993, only to be assassinated days before his second trial. As the Vichy made war on the enemies of the homeland within, they also fought against Germany's enemies without. April of 1941 saw an anti-British coup in Iraq, an event the Germans were eager to capitalize on. Germany offered the Patal government a release of French POWs if they would allow the Luftwaffe to operate out of French Syria, a deal the Vichy readily accepted. German planes were in position by early May, and the Vichy French and Nazi Germans went on to utterly fail in their objectives. The British crushed the revolt and followed up their victory with a joint Free French-British invasion of Syria and Lebanon. 
Just over a month later, the Allies were in control of both colonies, and for all their trouble, the Vichy French received absolutely nothing from the Germans. From 1941 to 1942, the small Vichy garrisons throughout Africa would see minor action as British forces attempted to keep them corralled. Though the British initially were able to completely blockade the garrison in Djibouti, for example, Japan's East Asian Blitzkrieg forced the British to reorganize, and the blockade of Djibouti was abandoned, allowing the fascist French to send intelligence on British naval movements through the Suez Canal to their German allies. This would not be the end of Vichy troubles, however, as the British launched an assault on the island of Madagascar, long held as a French colony and loyal to Pitan. On May 5th, British forces landed in an attempt to deny the Japanese friendly ports so close to shipping lanes in Southeast Asia. The British were able to seize the island, but did so without consulting their junior partner, de Gaulle. The leader of the Free French made an open overture to the Soviets in response, indicating interest in re-establishing the Free French headquarters in Moscow. The British, like any scared partner, bought de Gaulle's affection by naming the Free French as the new government in Madagascar. As the Cross of Lorraine was raised over Madagascar, the Allies laid plans for another offensive in Africa, one that would ultimately lead to the dissolution of Vichy France. In November 1942, the Allies launched Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. Allied forces swept into the Vichy French territories of Morocco and Algeria, and the Germans decided that an invasion of southern France would likely follow the Allied attack. To prevent this, Hitler ordered Case Anton, the military occupation of Vichy France. As the Nazis goose-stepped into Vichy territory, several of Pétain's advisors encouraged him to flee to what territory they still held in Africa, but the collaborationist dictator refused. The Vichy state began to rot from the inside under German occupation. Pierre Laval, buoyed by French fascists who hoped to ride his coattails, ascended to the role of prime minister, succeeding his pal Pétain but the two were little more than figureheads to deliver German orders in French accents. The Vichy authorities began to chafe under their newfound yokes, with government offices dragging their feet on German orders or passively refusing to comply with their former partners. Others took more direct action. Admiral Darlan, who in the time between his private war on the Royal Navy and Operation Torch had served in a number of government posts, was in Algeria when the Allies made landfall, and decided that his coat could use a good turn. Derlon made contact with the Americans, and the two negotiated the sweetest of sweetheart deals. The Americans would back Derlon taking control of French North Africa, and he would rally support for the Allies on the ground. Derlon would never get the chance, however, as an anti-Vichy assassin slew him in December of 1943. As the Germans began exercising more and more direct control over Vichy France, their collaborators began vying for power in Vichy circles. This led to infighting that culminated in an attempted coup by Pétain against his former deputy. Pétain and a cabal of ministers reasoned that perhaps Germany wouldn't win the war after all, and if they could wrest back control, Vichy France could open negotiations with the Allies and control the outcome of the peace talks. Hitler knew of Pétain's plan and explicitly warned the Marshal of the consequences of failure. So naturally, Pétain went ahead anyways, and the Germans ensured he failed. The marshal was imprisoned by the Germans, whose price for saving Laval's diminished position was the installation of Parisian ministers loyal to Germany. Overall, most Vichy ministers stood by their government for various reasons – indoctrination, guaranteed pay, or the safety of their families. This loyalty kept the Vichy regime on life support until Operation Overlord. As the Allies drove into France through the summer and fall of 1944, Pétain and Laval were forcibly removed to Germany. The Germans re-established the seat of the Vichy government in the town of Siegmaringen, but Laval refused to comply with the Germans in protest of his relocation, and Pétain had long since abandoned collaboration. The Free French were installed as the new French government following the liberation of Paris, stripping Pétain and Laval of what little power they had left. Finally, the Vichy government limped along until the Allies liberated Siegmaringen in 1945. 
With the war's end, it was time for Bataille to return to France. He was offered asylum by the Swiss, but steadfastly refused. The former dictator was adamant that the French people needed to hear his side of the story and stood trial in 1945 under the auspices of the de Gaulle government. Pétain believed the Free French government was illegitimate, and save for delivering a prepared statement lauding the Vichy regime as protector of France, remained largely silent, refusing to dignify what he saw as a sham trial with his participation. The tribunal proceeded regardless, and Pétain was convicted of treason. The 89-year-old Pétain was sentenced to death, but de Gaulle personally commuted his sentence to life imprisonment at the court's request. The fallen idol of the French people was shuffled between a handful of prisons and private homes until his declining health led to his death in 1951. There is a popular image of France as the doormat upon which Germany wiped their jackboots on their way to conquering Europe. The fight for France was certainly uneven, but reducing the entire French war experience to simply surrendering ignores the nuanced and complicated truth of a nation brought low by a true force of evil. The Vichy regime was an attempt by a cabal of uncaring opportunists to reap the rewards of chaos a cavalcade of brown-nosing for personal profit paired with the very real collaboration of civilians and partisan fighters. Ironically, this fascinating and sinister facet of the Second World War is often overlooked in favor of the simplistic narrative of French surrender followed by the romantic struggle of the French resistance, a unified monolith struggling until the dawn of Allied liberation. But history, like truth, resists simplicity. The history of France, especially.